In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. I can't tell you how I've been looking forward to saying those words to you and seeing you again. Folks, I'm just so thrilled to be back. Uh, I've been so looking forward to, to being back in the post. After what has been a wonderful sabbatical, it was everything that I needed it to be. I've come back with so much zing and bounce, you do need to watch out. But I'm good for another 10 years now, so uh, we're going to have fun over this uh, next decade. I've come with so many ideas and energy. I'm well aware of those who have carried extra burdens to enable me to go away. And while really I want to thank everybody and all those hidden and secret roles, I'm not going to make a big speech now, but I do particularly want to thank Lyndon, Patrick and Paul, the church wardens, the ad administrator, and all those who have stepped into other roles over and beyond uh, what normally would happen. I am grateful that you have allowed me to have a sabbatical. It, it has done me the world of good. Um, and I want to thank all of you for your generosity in enabling me uh, to go away and have that time. It really has been wonderful. But I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to be back this morning. And so uh, we're going to have a good time of worship and celebration and I hope joy as we are reunited once more. I will now stop talking for a bit. <laughs> So as we gather ourselves into this, into this space, into this holiness, into this place, let's prepare our hearts and our minds for worshipping the incredible, the wonderful and the loving God we have who loves us beyond measure. We pray together. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. So we remember those less fortunate than ourselves, and particularly in Ukraine. We light our prayer candle and we pray. God of peace and justice, we pray, we continue to pray for the people of Ukraine today. We pray for peace and the laying down of weapons. We pray for all those who fear for tomorrow, that your spirit of comfort would draw near to them we pray for those with power over war or peace. And we pray that they might have wisdom, discernment and compassion to guide their decisions. And above all, Lord, we pray for your precious children at risk and in fear, that you would hold and protect them. We pray this in the name of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. So as we remember that love which is always already waiting for us in this place, let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolved to keep God's commandments and to live in love and peace with all. Most merciful God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we have sinned in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been. Help us to amend what we are and direct what we shall be, that we may do justly, love mercy and walk humbly with you, our God. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, 
through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Generous God, you give us gifts and make them grow. Though our faith is small as a mustard seed, make it grow to your glory and the flourishing of your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We sit for the readings. A reading from the book of Ecclesiastes. Vanity of vanities, says the teacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and a chasing after wind. I hated all my toil in which I had toiled under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to those who come after me and who knows whether they will be wise or foolish. Yet they will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned and gave my heart up to despair concerning all the toil of my labors under the sun, because sometimes one who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave all to be enjoyed by another who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What do mortals get from all the toil and strain with which they toil under the sun. For all their days are full of pain, and their work is of vexation. Even at night their minds do not rest. This also is vanity. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The refrain to Psalm 49 is... My mouth, O Lord, shall speak of wisdom. My mouth, O Lord, shall speak of wisdom. Hear this, all you peoples. 
Listen, all you that dwell in the world, you of low or high degree, both rich and poor together. My mouth shall speak of wisdom, and my heart shall meditate on understanding. My mouth, O Lord, shall speak of wisdom. I will incline my ear to a parable. I will unfold my riddle with the lyre. Why should I fear in evil days when the malice of my foes surrounds me, such as trust in their goods and glory in the abundance of their riches? My mouth, O Lord, shall speak of wisdom. For no one can indeed ransom another or pay to God the price of deliverance. To ransom a soul is too costly. There is no price one could pay for it, so that they might live forever and never see the grave. My mouth, O Lord, shall speak of wisdom. For we see that the wise die also. With the, with the foolish and ignorant they perish and leave their riches to others. Their tomb is their home forever, their dwelling through all generations though they call their lands after their own names. Those who have honor but lack understanding are like the beasts that perish. My mouth, O Lord, shall speak of wisdom. A reading from the letter to the Colossians. So if you have been raised with Christ... Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourself with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you. 
Jesus said to the crowd, take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Friends, the Lord be with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Someone in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to the crowd, take care, be on your guard against all kind of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly. And he thought to himself, what should I do? For I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life is being demanded of you. And the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May we speak and hear in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, friends, it is my final sermon here at St. John's. You can breathe a sigh of relief. And I have saved the big one until last. Because today, my friends, I want to talk about wrath. And don't worry, I haven't been saving up all the fire and brimstone for the end. You are safe. But I want to talk about wrath because so often we don't talk about it. And it sits there, doesn't it, making us feel anxious whenever we see it on the page. And although we can all breathe a sigh of relief when the reader has passed over it and we've turned the page, it still leaves that little question in the back of our minds, doesn't it, about God and anger. But as with so many things, there are two ways of looking at wrath. One which I think brings anxiety, and one which I'm certain brings us closer to God's abundant life. Hopefully you'll agree by the end. The anxious way of thinking about wrath is probably the one we're all familiar with, when I say that word, it probably makes you think of God sitting in the sky like some scary Father Christmas, waiting to punish the people who are naughty and to reward the people who are nice. Is that sounding familiar? It's hard to know how to relate to that kind of God, I find. Somehow, to me, it feels quite mechanistic. If you're good, head to the right. If you're bad, head to the left. But this way think of thinking about wrath as punishment only really took off at the time of the Reformation. That's about the same time that Henry VIII was happily chopping off Anne Boleyn's head. And at the same time, the legal profession was taking off in Europe, and suddenly people were going to lawyers and judges for the first time to settle disputes rather than noblemen. But if, like me, you don't like thinking about God as some scary judge in the sky, then, friends, I have good news for you. Because as is so often the case, I am sure you will all agree, your anxieties can all be solved by a quick and easy lesson in biblical Greek. 
didn't sound like you were less anxious. So the Greek word translated normally as wrath, you'll be glad to know, has absolutely nothing to do with punishment. The word is orge. It's where we get the word organic from. And far from punishment, that word we translate as wrath actually means passion or lust or fertility. Elsewhere, it's used to describe meadows in flower and well-watered fields. Used as a verb, it means to ripen and to fruit. And so rather than wrath, I think we would do much better if we translated that little word, or gay, as wildness. Because that's what it really describes. It refers to God's creative love as it rushes and greens through the soil. It refers to God's passion for justice and God's rage at suffering. It refers to God's lust for life and God's desire for us to flourish. And rather than some terrifying moment of judgment that we will either pass or fail, or gay, or wildness, refers to the endless movement of God's love, driving all things towards life, calling all people towards justice, inviting all things towards joy. We see this wildness when Christ cries out against suffering on the cross, and that same wildness comes back three days as laughter when Jesus rises from the tomb and embraces Mary Magdalene. So rather than running away and hiding from God's wildness, I think we are called to jump on in. To jump in and let it transform us. To let God fill us with the same love for life. The same rage against injustice. To let God's life ripen and bring forth the fruits of the Spirit in our lives to let ourselves be filled with the laughter of the resurrection and to step into God's renewal of the world with that same joy. It is, I am glad to say, exactly the opposite of that stale old anger that we see in Ecclesiastes, where the poor old teacher sits around having a really good sulk. I don't know if you noticed in that first reading, but my, oh my, what a sulk. And I don't know about you, but I love a sulk. There's nothing better in the world, in fact, than that feeling that you're right and everyone else is wrong. And even when someone comes and tells you to cheer up, you just get to sulk about them, don't you? It's a lovely feeling. And as the teacher in Ecclesiastes looks back over his life's work, having a lovely sulk, he's worried that it's all been for nothing and that the people who will inherit it after him will waste and spoil everything he leaves behind. If any of you are familiar with the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, the teacher in Ecclesiastes, I think, is very much the Marvin of the Old Testament. Got a brain the size of a planet, but what's the point? And driven by his anxiety, and again, by that seductive feeling of really enjoying that good sulk, the teacher forgets his place in that great flow of God's life. He forgets that he himself is just the steward of what was handed on to me. He forgets that if his gardens have grown, it's because the people who came before him left him fertile soil. He forgets that if his throne has flourished, it's because generations of kings before him have worked hard to establish it. Just like the long line of women, I think, playing smaller matches in muddier fields, barely noticed by any spectators at all, each of them simply doing their best to build on the foundation handed on to them until we come gloriously to this evening when surely, surely we will win. If there's any God in the world. <laughs> yeah. And so rather than letting go and jumping in, to that great movement of God's life, that wildness, what Paul calls the renewal of all things until Christ fills all in all. Our poor old sulky teacher is so obsessed by his desire to possess everything, to control it, to make it permanent, 
that he ends up hating the very things he's trying to hold on to. He's so worried about what will happen to everything tomorrow that he can't enjoy it today. And in today's gospel, Jesus tells a similar story about another man who's driven not by anxiety, but by greed. This man has inherited a plot of land which is full of God's orge, God's wildness. That fertile, fruitful plot where crops seem to magically abound year after year, greening with God's life. But rather than just taking what he needs and then sharing the surplus with his neighbours... Our greedy man is driven by that desire, maybe to show off his status to his neighbours, perhaps simply to look after himself and let his neighbours do the same. And like the teacher in Ecclesiastes, he too forgets his place in the wider life of the world and the community. He too forgets that everything he has has been received as a gift. He too forgets to be grateful and to be generous. And of course, because this is a good old parable, he ends up losing it all. He never gets to enjoy that time of plenty he so anxiously and expensively prepared for. I think Jesus is saying that rather than building bigger and bigger storehouses, he should have spent his money building bigger and bigger dining tables, welcoming more and more people to come and share in his surplus. From their number, he could easily have found others to come and help him work the land when he was too old. In them, he would have found the riches of friendship and joy in the here and now. But instead, he ends up with full storehouses and an empty life. And I imagine a really good sulk when he gets to heaven. In this story, Jesus is reminding his listeners that true wealth and success is, of course, not measured by how much we can store up for ourselves, but how much we give away. He's encouraging them to let go of their anxiety about the future and instead to embrace their place in that great line of people who have passed on all that they received from one generation to the next. And this, of course, is the truth that we live out every day in this place. Conscious of all those who have gone before us, conscious of all of those who will come to worship after us. This one small place where God's wild love flourishes and bears so many unexpected fruits. One small place caught up in the renewal of the whole world. One small place where people are rich towards God and one another. And where the joy of Christ slowly but surely goes about filling all in all. Amen. So as we come before that wild and generous and passionate divine love which knows no bounds, which knows no obstacles, but which loves us just as we are with an everlasting love. So let us declare to God our receptivity to receiving that wild, passionate love as we stand together and say the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. 
On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. So in the power of the Spirit and in union with Christ, let us pray to our Father. Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your wonderful creation and your many gifts to us. We thank you for this holiday time when we can enjoy the sun, sea, countryside and gardens and that we are able to gather here and online to worship you. We pray for those traveling for work and holidays that they may have safe journeys and that the rail strikes may be resolved. We pray for teachers that they enjoy their holiday, for children that they are kept safe and away from harm, and patience for their parents. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for rain for our plants. We remember those affected by climate change through drought, floods and fires, and those who have lost their homes. We pray that we are mindful of other people and willing to share what you have given us. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We pray for our bishops, Stephen, Karen and Andrew, and for our own church and clergy, for Helen as she returns from her sabbatical, for Lyndon as he prepares for his new post, for Patrick and for Paul, and for the events planned for August, the barbecue and the newcomers party. We pray for the Northreach project and all involved in the building. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We thank you for our church worldwide and in the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for the Church of the Province of West Africa. In the Diocese of Salisbury, we pray for Harnham St. George and All Saints in Salisbury Deanery. And its clergy, Becky Roberts and the new curate, Reverend Mike Badger. That God's love should be shown and known. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. With churches together in Broadstone, we pray for your church around the world and in this place. We long to see your kingdom come, and we ask that you use us to be your hands and feet and voice wherever there is need or isolation or grief. We pray you will help us to be good stewards of your creation good listeners where people are struggling, and good companions where people are searching for you. Lord Jesus, come into our world afresh and turn longing in loneliness into belonging and fellowship. We pray for the Queen and Royal Family and that she enjoys a time of relaxation after the busy Jubilee events. We pray for those voting for the next Prime Minister, that they are guided to choose the best person to lead us and not be swayed by prejudice, prejudice or self-interest. We pray for those participating and watching the Commonwealth Games and thank you that sport can unite different countries. 
We pray for the athletes that they are kept from injury. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We remember those on the parish list who are frail, sick or suffering. Robert, Bill, Dorothy, David, Roger, Robert, Veronica, Audrey Bailey, Anne, Betty, Elaine, Christopher, Pam. And ask for your blessing on them, that they know your peace and healing. And we think of others known to us personally who need your healing touch at this time. We remember those who have died recently. Ted Butler, Joan Vinnie, Lavinia Bunn, Philip Nash, Yvonne Revel, and Irene Thompson. And ask that you comfort their family and friends with your promise of eternal life. May they rest in peace and rise in glory. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand for the peace. Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. The peace of the Lord be always with you. So we offer one another the wave of peace. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you.
Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this bread to set before you, which earth has given and human hands have made. It will become for us the bread of life. Blessed be God forever. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to set before you, fruit of the vine and work of human hands. It will become for us the cup of salvation. Blessed be God forever. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. From sunrise to sunset, this day is holy, for Christ has risen from the tomb and scattered the darkness of death with light that will not fade. This day the risen Lord walks with your gathered people, unfolds for us your word and makes himself known in the breaking of the bread. And though the night will overtake this day, you summon us to live in endless light, the never-ceasing Sabbath of the Lord. And so, with choirs of angels and with all the heavenly host, we proclaim your glory and join their unending song of praise. our praises heavenly father through your son our saviour jesus christ and as we follow his example and obey his command grant that by the power of your holy spirit these gifts of bread and wine may be to us his body and his blood who in the same night that he was betrayed took bread and gave you thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave you thanks. He gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. Therefore, Heavenly Father, we remember this offering of himself made once for all upon the cross. We proclaim his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension. We look for the coming of your kingdom and with this bread and this cup, we make the memorial of Christ, your son, our Lord. Great is the mystery of faith. Through him, our great high priest, this, our sacrifice of thanks and praise. And as we eat and drink these holy gifts in the presence of your divine majesty, renew us by your spirit, 
inspire us with your love and unite us in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, with all who stand before you in earth and heaven, we worship you, Father Almighty, in songs of everlasting praise. our Saviour has taught us, so we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. a reminder that all are welcome and there will be two stations myself and Lyndon uh, if you are gluten-free then make your way to Lyndon because he will have the gluten-free wafers God's holy gifts for God's holy people Jesus Christ is holy Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father
Let us pray. Lord God, whose Son is the true vine and the source of life, ever giving himself that the world may live, may we so receive within ourselves the power of his death and passion, that in his saving cup we may share his glory and be made perfect in his love. For he is alive and reigns now and forever. Amen. We say together, Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. So we come to the notices. Uh, they're all about food, which is excellent. They're all about food. Apart from just to say, uh, apologies, half meant apologies for the flower arch, which is still outside the porch. That's from a lovely wedding we had here on Friday, as these flowers on the pew ends are. Uh, and I take it as a good sign that the party went well on Friday night, that no one turned up on Saturday to remove the flowers. Uh, <laughs> but we continue to pray for Georgie and Benny, who got married here. Uh, other notices next week of course is my final Sunday so we will be having a bring and share feast after the service people please do bring please do share um, and we're asking if possible to bring a list of ingredients or at least allergens which are included in your food if you can uh, then we've got tickets uh, or invitations really at the very back of church on the table for the newcomers party later in August on the 21st so if you are or feel like a newcomer or would like to meet some newcomers please pick up an invitation and then we've got uh, on the 14th of August the barbecue tickets are now for sale after this service and from the office during the week and finally if you'd like to come to Oxford and eat their cake uh, my licensing service is on Wednesday the 28th of September and you have until next Sunday to book a place on the coach and we'll make sure that there is plenty of food for everyone. Otherwise, I wish you all a very good week. Thank you. We wish you a very good week to Lyndon, your last week in the parish. I won't say too much because we'll both be off, so <laughs> we'll get through next week somehow. You are such a blessing to me, and it is such a joy to now be able to send you out with a blessing. Please stand, if you can. May the Father, from whom every family in earth and heaven receives its name, strengthen you with his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
friends go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.